Jamie Sertani. Um, I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, Jamie is somebody who has had an incredible junior career and then an, an incredible collegiate career at Brown University. Um, those of you who don't know, it's an Ivy League, and Ivy Leagues are pretty tough to get in with tennis and, of course, academic being the staple piece. So uh, in his freshman year, he was the uh, rookie of the year of the Ivy, Ivy Conference, and his second year on the team, he led him to their first ever Ivy title. And the school's been around for like 300, 400 years. So that's a, that to me is a really impressive part. Um, from there, I mean, he, you have had so many accolades. I'm just going to read a few. You're at first all-time in doubles wins, second all-time in combined wins. And you're currently, well, currently, I think 2016 Hall of Fame for, for Brown University Sports. So congratulations on that. That's an incredible uh, feat. And I hopefully all of you guys have that opportunity. Uh, then after that, you joined the Pro Tour, have been on the Pro Tour for 15 years. Uh, I'm sure I, there's so many stories on that. Um, high is number 45 in the world, has played all the Grand Slams, two-time quarterfinalist at, at Wimbledon, has uh, won a tournament, I think Newport with Leander Pace. I mean, just, I mean, I, I'm sure there's so many more things out there, but um, if I missed anything, please let me know. We're just super excited to have you. No, that's great, man. I appreciate the uh, very warm welcome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been a great ride. And uh, everyone, great to meet you. It's great to be here. Um, really grateful for the opportunity to uh, get to know you guys and answer any questions you might have about the tour and uh, my experience and, and how I can help you guys on your pathway to success. Well, I will, I will ask the first question that's kind of to me, it's a little bit unique, but you've played tennis your whole life. What do you love about this game so much? Like, what does it mean to you? Well, that's a great question, um, first of all. And, you know, I've been asked that question many times throughout my career. Um, and, um, you know, at this point, for me, um, it's just, for me, I love learning. I love to grow. Uh, learning and growing uh, on a daily basis through the process of playing and uh, practicing, competing. Um, that's, that's what's most rewarding for me. You know, uh, you know, obviously I've achieved a lot in, in my, uh, in my career. Uh, I've worked really hard for that, but um, the most rewarding parts is not necessarily all the wins and the lot and the big victories, but, but just that feeling of accomplishment when you improve something uh, through hard work, you know, and, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe even through a loss, you know, you lose a tough match and you're really disappointed, uh, cause you lost the match, but you know, you, you regroup afterwards and the emotions settle down and maybe you have a chat with yourself or your coach or your, or your, or your teachers or your mom or dad, um, or your friends, you know, and, and you learn something about what you did wrong in the match and, and how you can improve it through, uh, through hard work and discipline and, and getting back on the practice court. So with, with that being said, so imagine most of our audience, as I mentioned to you, are around 11 to 17. If you can go back to your mindset back then, can you tell me a few things that you, you're proud of that you had the mindset? And then a few things, if you could go back in time, you could smack yourself or be like, hey, <laughs> you know, don't look at this, look at that. Sure. No, that's a great question. Um, you know, when I was young, I was always a very um, motivated person. So uh you know, I, I had this, um, let's say, desire or this drive within myself um, to, to really try to be the best that I could be, you know. Um, and that's really what, in my opinion, it's all about. I still have that now. Um, so I guess I, I, I got that from my, my, my coaches, I would say, maybe, or, my, or maybe even my, my dad, who was like a really passionate uh, coach that really drove me to be successful. But it, it became who I was, too, and still who I am today. So that that's something I remember always, like, even if I lost, I was really upset about it. And I felt like I could do better the next time. Um, so that's one thing I was proud of. And then, you know, one of the things that I would look back at myself and say, oh, I wish I had been better at that. Or like you said, smack yourself in the face. But, um, you know, sometimes I'm a little bit too tough on myself. And I was back then, you know, I remember losing a match and just not communicating well. Uh, after the match, especially with my, with my, you know, my family, my friends, my supporters, people that care about me and that want to see me do well. 
um, you know, sometimes you get a little bit over emotional about stuff. And, and I've learned from that experience, especially now that I'm a little bit older and more mature and, and, and I've learned from these experiences um, that it's best to just maybe take, if it's 15 minutes or an hour, sometimes you mean, might need a whole day or just go take a shower and get, and get washed up and then uh, and, and take a deep breath before I you know, beat myself up too much about it. Because sometimes you, you communicate poorly with your, with your team, but sometimes you also communicate poorly with yourself. Yeah. Um, and, and when I did that, you know, I, I always was in a bad place. You know, I, it always took me a day or two or a week or two weeks or you get in a little bit of a funk to get out of that funk. Oh. The positive catalyst. So that's something I, I think you always need to work on that. I mean, I, I guess I'm jumping a little forward, but is there uh, anything particular that you do in your routine now to get over a, a tough loss? Is there like music, stretching? Is there a routine yeah. that, well, first of all, is, there, is your routine different after a match, whether you win or lose? And then my follow-up question is, how do you now get over those losses quicker? Great question. Again, uh, you're three for three. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm done. That's it. That's all I got. The rest yeah, is on you. Carry back a thousand, bro. Um, no, man. I mean, that, so that's a great topic that you bring up. Basically, like when I was younger, you know, you win a match, everyone's great, life is great. I'm feeling good, big smiles. You lose a match, boom, you're down, dumps heads down, body language is bad, you know. Um, and that's normal because it doesn't feel good to win, to lose, and it feels great to win, right? Everyone knows yeah. that. Um, so now it's about managing those two emotions. You know, I think a lot of uh, success in, uh, on tour uh, and, and, and success in life, quite frankly, is about managing emotions. You know, I mean, things are going to happen that are really awesome and we get pumped and we're getting, you know, going crazy or enjoying things are going to be happening. There are going to be a lot of challenges as well. Um, things that, you know, we didn't plan for or didn't expect or didn't want to happen. Uh, so a lot of challenges in life and, and, when you win or lose a tennis match now, I mean, to answer your question, you know, win or lose, you know, you try to carry yourself with class, we say, you know, shake the guy's hand. I guess now it's going to be an elbow bump, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, just kind of keep your emotions controlled. You know, I mean, and in, inside you might be angry or upset that you lost the match or inside you must be, you might be pumped, you know, and that's okay. And that's good. And that's normal. Both emotions are normal. Everyone's going to experience that. Um, but you want to try to keep that on an even keel and keep it controlled. Um, and that way the highs don't get hot too high and the lows don't get too low. I'm sure you guys have all heard that, uh, but it's very true. It's easier, easier said than done. So you got to work on that stuff all the time and, you know, communicate with your coaches or your buddies that are working on the same stuff. It's yeah. always, more, it's always more fun to do the stuff together. You know, yeah. if you have somebody you like hanging out with, you got a buddy or a sister. Uh, or brother or whatever um but yeah that that would be my my answer to that question is try to keep it relaxed and then and then how do you do that so we we you asked a good question the post-match routine win or lose is you go right to the gym so if if you lose and you're feeling down but you know you actually have something to do right now so mm -hmm. it's a great way to maintain your process you know maintain the same process every day so you have that consistency. You don't lose your focus. You don't lose track. Uh, you know, you don't get distracted and, and, you know, eat, you know, 10, 10 gallons of ice cream every day for a week, <laughs> you know? So you just um, keep, keep doing the next right thing and that's get a good stretch, uh, go to the gym, maybe get on the bike a little bit, get a cool down. I find a great little, uh, tactic that I use, and I know a lot of players use this is, you know, when we finish a match, our energy is pretty jacked up, you know? And uh, so a great way to burn off that energy, you do it in a positive way. So let's use that energy, that adrenaline or whatever you want to call it, um, and, and use it in a positive way. That might be by going to the bike, you know, for five, 10 minutes, maybe even doing a few weights, even believe it or not, great way to blow off a little steam uh, after a tough loss. Um, and usually actually going to the gym is the best way to, to, uh, cope with a loss because that's the best time to to do some weights because you have a long window between your that match and your next match on the tour you know so you have that four or five day window where you're not going to be sore uh before your next match so 
Nice. Wow, that's really good. Really helpful. I, I, I think, uh, you know, some people are going to say, oh, I don't have a gym. Well, you have a jump rope. So you can go and do the yep. exact same thing or go for a little jog or do different things. So I, that's, I think that's a, that's a great, great answer. Um, so let's fast forward a little bit to your college time. Um, you know, why did you choose Brown in the, in the first place? Um, and then, uh, you know, was it everything you expected to be or how was it, how was actually that transition to a, a team environment versus just kind of on your own playing by yourself? Yeah, sure. No, great question. Um, is it four for four? Or am I going four for four? You're, you're, you're nailing it, man. Yeah. All right, good, good. Just want to make sure I'm, I'm staying consistent. So that's good. Big love, big love. <laughs> um yeah no the college experience was i still to this day and i've done I, some great things on the on the tour but to college was some of the best days of my life you know um on court off court traveling with the guys being around the team being on campus going to school at the same time meeting some incredible people um some of the best friends that i have even to this day i mean are, are from from school actually my best friends in my life are from college. Um, I have a couple from my, my earlier days too, for sure. Um, but you know, you meet, you make some great friendships there, um, connect with some amazing people and some great educators. So I, I'm so grateful for my time uh, at Brown. Um, definitely recommend anyone that's interested in going there or to anyone that wants to go and enjoy the college experience at any college um, to, to definitely pursue that dream with, with passion. And um, cause it's a very rewarding time. And uh, it's just, I can't say enough about it, to be honest with you. But, um, no, with the, with the guys team, you know, playing with a team is obviously a little bit different. You know, you, you, you're not an individual anymore. Well, you are, but you're, but you're working. You're actually, you're actually um, playing for two teams. You're playing for yourself. You're playing for your team. Uh, I would add a third dimension. You're playing for your, for your school, your university. Um, also you're playing for your family, you know, you're representing your family name there at a, at a great institution, uh, somewhere in the country or the world. Um, and that's a really, uh, it's a special feeling, you know, you're uniting with your, your brothers or your sisters, uh, um, if you're playing men's or women's tennis and, yeah. and that's just, uh, it's pretty awesome. And then you get your friends and hopefully a lot of fans come out to support you. Um, uh, and that makes it even more special when you get, five, 10, 20, 100, couple hundred fans watching you play. Um, it really, it, it's inspiring. And um, so it's rewarding in so many ways. Is there, um, when, cause obviously your double success, and I know you played, you had a pretty good s singles career, but your, your double success started in college. When you got there, were you already a double specialist or did this somehow develop? Um, that is a very good question. Again, and, and you know, Actually, no. I mean, I was, I think about this a fair bit. I was just a singles player, to be honest. And I think most players start as singles players. Um, that's kind of how the foundation of the game starts. And you play doubles as well. And, you know, some players enjoy playing doubles, some don't, you know. Some enjoy playing singles, some don't. So you kind of find, kind of find your niche eventually at some point, whether it's in the juniors or, the, or college or after college. Um, and I think w with my game specifically, I'm, I'm a serving volleyer. I was in singles. Uh, grew up in the uh, New England area. I was uh, from Boston. Uh, so a lot of those indoor courts, I don't know if you know, if you played some indoor tennis, it was lightning, fa lightning fast. Yeah. You know, we're talking super fast indoors. So it was, very, it was very advantageous for the serving volley player coming in, being aggressive, chip and charge. I don't know if you youngsters, some of you guys remember Pete Sampras. Anybody here remember Pete Sampras? One of the, yeah, you guys remember him, right? Yeah. <laughs> best, best serve volley player of all time, right? You guys know what's up, of course. I don't know. I would say Edberg, in my Edberg, opinion. Edberg, <laughs> Edberg, maybe that's before your time. I don't know. <laughs> no, but Pete, Pete, you can't argue against Pete on anything. Sorry to interrupt. But yeah, I was a fan yeah, of Edberg. Right. So. You, you, got, you got Edberg, you got Boris, you know? Yeah. A lot of greats. But Pete Sampras, everyone knows. He's yeah. best you know, I grew up admiring him. You know, he was one of my idols growing up. And uh, Johnny Mac, to be honest with you, Johnny Mac, amazing. Yeah. John McEnroe, I'm sure you guys hear him uh, announcing. He does a lot of commentating, right? He's yeah. a legend of the game. And he was my first inspiration. He's a lefty like us, Sanjay. Um, so, you know, just coming in and he's being aggressive, taking over at net. And that's where I thrived, you know, in my singles and did really well. Um, 
the junior level, the college level. I was top 50 in singles in, in college, uh, top 10 in doubles. So I guess I, I just kind of excelled naturally in doubles because of that serving volley, like that it, it easily transitioned into a, you know, a serving, uh, a, a, good, a good doubles play, you know, good doubles uh, tactic, of course. So it was an easy transition. And then when I went on the tour, I played both, but I was winning a lot of these futures and, you know, maybe making the second round quarterfinals of the singles. I made one final in a, in a future uh, in singles, which, which was good times, you know. <laughs> I was reminiscing about that the other day in a couple semis, but, you know, I was winning most, many of the doubles and I moved up quite quickly and I just had to make that, that decision. So it wasn't really till the tour that I exclusively uh, went with the dubs. Yep. So when, when uh, you, let's say uh, it's 2005, you're deciding to go pro, um, you graduate. Uh, did you even have a resume for any jobs or you made that decision right away? You're like, there's no, the, I'm not making the resume. You know, Tom Brady tweeted his resume like a couple uh, weeks ago. He's like, in case I don't get drafted, here's my resume. It was pretty wow. funny. Wow. So, so I was just wondering if you ever had one or did you have a clear decision or wow. even... No, yeah, actually, I didn't know that about Tom Brady. That, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Tom's a, obviously a legend in my area. Everyone loves Tom Brady. You know, You're night. dealing with a lot of Eagles people, so you might not want to. Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Carson, my... Carson Wentz? I don't know. Who is it? Who do you guys have? Carson, you got Nick Foles and Carson Vince. There's a division. You have McNabb, so there's, there's a division. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I took us off topic. <laughs> <laughs> Completely my fault. Um. No, what was the question again? We were talking. Um, I was saying, did you have an e easy decision to go pro? Was it a clear decision to go pro? Oh, it was amazing. So, no, it was tough. Very tough. You know, I, 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 Brown's a great school for those of you that don't know it. And I had um, definitely some interests in, in, in the business world. Uh, I studied economics, business economics at, at Brown. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I studied a little bit of, uh, you know, international studies as well. So I had some interests to go into the business world and definitely was considering that. And you know, I see all my friends and yeah. my teammates also doing that as well. And nobody was really trying to go pro. And, and um, it was tough. Dude. It was a very stressful, uh, stressful, but like an, you know, difficult decision, you know, and, and you're going to have a lot of difficult decisions all the way up through your junior career uh, at every, at every age. And usually it happens like, when you start school, you end school. And so those are usually when I found that I've had to make the, the biggest decisions in my life at, at that age. Um, and this was one of them. And, and, you know, I consulted with my family. My dad was my coach um, forever since day one. And uh, so, you know, we had a family discussion about it. He was always inspiring me to, to pursue my dreams and to really, you know, do what I wanted to do with my athletic ability, you know, or talent or whatever you want to call it. Um, and so I, I gave it a shot, man. And he, and he, he supported me the first couple of years out there. And he's a, he's been an amazing influence in my life. Very grateful to have him. That's nice. Um, and you know, okay. these, these inspirations come from all different sources. Can be a friend, family, coach, you know, uh, hopefully I'm inspiring you guys to pursue your dreams too. I mean, yeah, that's really what it's all about. You know, it's any, anybody can be a mentor, anyone can be a source of inspiration. Um, so that's that's kind of why I did that. Uh, so, and honestly, I never expected to be here in front of you guys. You know, I expected to be a year or two, try it out. And you never know what happens when you put your mind to something. You can achieve anything. No, I think I think that's great. And I have we I received a bunch of questions that I want to kind of get through relate related specifically to doubles and like tactical side of things. But my my last question that I have for you is kind of for a lot of these kids, they see pro tennis and they see the Grand Slams and what's on TV. So whether you want to talk about now or I'm assuming the first two, three years are, are a lot different than now, what can you tell us, like, what is the real, realistically, what's the view of like pro tennis? What does it look like from traveling? And what are some things that people don't, I guess when you're younger, you don't think about that could maybe, I don't know if it's inspiring or if it's, putting your head down and working harder kind of what are your thoughts on that oh sure it's uh it's important to have accurate perspective as to what it's like on the tour and 
Yeah. I think there's a lot of people out there that have this glamorous view in their mind of, wow, they're traveling around the world playing at the, the biggest venues and the grand slams and the big tournaments and the big cities and the beautiful places in Europe and Australia and Paris, Rome, New York City, of course. And they're all wonderful places, and that's true, but I think it's important to, to have a, a, a bigger perspective on what it takes to get there because a lot of people focus on the final product, um, which is, 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 is the beautiful thing if you're able to get to that final product, but it takes a lot of work. Uh, it takes a lot of discipline and, and you know, a few uh, huge challenges along the way. And I think what you said is a great way to um, describe it. I mean, if you treat it like a business and just kind of put your head down and go to work every day and just try to find a small little detail that you can improve on. Um, maybe the forehand's not working that day or the serve or the volley or anything, your footwork, um, you know, eating well and having good diet. Um, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of little, let's say variables in the formula of being successful um, on the tour. And, and we could talk for an hour about that, yeah. maybe, maybe a day. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff that, that comes up. You're traveling, traveling's not easy. You know, it can be exhausting at times, long flights, waiting in airports, um, missing a flight that's happened. I think probably everybody on the tour <laughs> flights get delayed, snowstorms. Um, you know, maybe your rackets don't arrive. That's happened to me. You borrow somebody else's racket, mm. uh, for, for a couple practices before your stuff arrives. So, you know, it, it, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. I, I really, really appreciate you sharing that because I think, and, and I'm just going to be blunt with, with everyone here from, from Legacy as well, is that I think a lot of times, especially this generation, they showcase the, the trophy pictures or you doing something well. And I, I don't know, you can speak for yourself, but for me, actually, a lot of times the story that is not on the social media post is a lot more exciting for me to talk about. You know, people want to talk about the best accomplishments, but for me, it's the underneath the iceberg, the work that you did or the little, little detail that it's not evident that to me makes the, the biggest impact. So I don't know if you feel the same way or you have a different perspective. Totally. I love the analogy and the metaphor of the, uh, the iceberg. Um, you know, what's happening below the surface is what matters. You know, um, what's happening below the surface is what enables you to see the product above the surface or whatever's above the surface. Um, so there's a lot of activity down there. And, um, you know, usually I, I like to say it's, it's not about what you're doing out in public in front of your friends and in front of the fans. It's really what, about what you're doing um, behind closed doors. You know, when everyone goes home at night, are you in the, are you in the hotel room or, or in your room at home? Um, doing some extra push-ups, you may be doing an extra plank, extra sit-ups, um, you know, cooking some fresh food and not going to McDonald's, not going to, you know, these fast food, you know, like joints if you don't have to, but trying to eat healthy or maybe farming your own food, uh, which is, is, is very cheap to do. It takes work, but you're gonna, you're gonna eat in a more healthy way. Um, you know, and, and trying to find these little ways to improve your game. That's really it. Nice. Well, that's good. I, I really hope everyone is, uh, is, is taking that in, especially somebody who's had such a long, successful career that those things have to have to happen. Um, I guess now I'll transition to some of the questions that we received. And uh, I guess I will go with how are singles, playing singles, and I know you're still playing singles, you're just playing singles, but singles compared to doubles, the mindset, um, how is it different? Obviously very different but from your perspective what are the kind of key elements that separate sure well i think that's a good question and there's a lot going on i mean i think in singles now that i've been playing quite a bit of singles this week it's been great to get back out there i mean i i love singles i love doubles i love both to be honest and, and they're two different mindsets the singles of course you know it, it's all it's just you out there so you know um you know, obviously you might have a coach or a team, uh, family supporters that are out there, you know, helping you to get there. And we have to remember that. Um, but when you're actually competing inside the court, you should, you know, it's you, it's one-on-one. -on -one. So 
you know, you're not interacting with a, a partner or a teammate at that time. Um, so in that respect, it's a little bit different. Of course, it's a little bit, I wouldn't say more or less physical, I, obviously a little bit more, much more physical in terms of endurance and having to cover more court. So, you know, if you're going to be a singles player, you got to make sure you have great endurance, especially with the side to side motion and movement and great flexibility to stay low and uh, get those legs nice and strong because it's, it's exhausting. I know I've played a couple ma six matches in the last two days. So, um, you know, you feel that. So you got to be very, uh, very diligent on, on with your body uh, to make sure it's, it's ready to go and you can go for a long period of time. Um, because everyone can play 5, 10, 15 minutes with good intensity, but if you can't sustain it, even if your level is really high for that first 15 minutes, then you can't compete for the, for the rest of the, the match. And then, you, and then you know, you'll probably lose because the other guy has better endurance than you do. So that's, what, I'd say, the first component to, to being successful in tennis. Um, you know, and then, of course, you develop your game from there. But uh, all these athletes are becoming really, really <clears throat> fit. Uh, healthy and they, their recovery times are incredible uh, and then in doubles it's a little bit different you know you have a really huge importance and I'm a doubles player is, is the, the way you communicate with your partner um, you know you got you young guys out there young girls out there you want to play successful doubles well you should probably choose someone that you communicate well with right so that you guys can exchange ideas maybe create a strategy on how you're going to attack your opponent's weaknesses, super important, uh, and have a game plan, you know? And then if the game plan works, great, continue doing it. If it doesn't work, then you make an adjustment, you make some changes, you know? So uh, doubles is great like that. That's why I'm a doubles player. I, I really enjoy the strategic aspect of the game, um, you know. It's how, do you, how do you yeah. handle if your opponent, if you're, there's certain people in this chat that I'm calling out on this. So I'll see if you can solve it for them. What happens when uh, your doubles partner is very negative towards you or towards themselves? Oof, great question. That is the best question so far. They've all been good, but that's the best one. <laughs> For me. Everyone's good. Well, when it comes to that, I mean, listen, I know everyone wants to win and everyone has a little bit of an ego because that's what it takes to improve and, and, and achieve goals. I get that. That's normal. But we really have to make sure we don't have a selfish attitude, you know? And because selfishness, it shows on a doubles court, you know? I mean, the only way that we're going to win together is if we give our best effort. And that means not just, not just physical, but mental. So once negative energy starts to come into play, you can guarantee that the level will go down. And if the level goes down, then you're not giving yourself your best chance to win. So I'm a huge believer, and this is kind of how I built my career, to be quite honest, in positive energy. And, you know, like I said earlier about the challenges they're going to face, that's one of them. And accepting that a lot of the challenges are mental, uh, not just physical. Because uh, everyone's a good player. I'm sure you guys all know that. You're competing and playing against each other. Everyone can play. Uh, some are better than others, but everyone can play the, the game. Uh, but if even the best player, if, if you have a bad mental day and you're just complaining, throwing the racket and lose your focus, you're going to lose to somebody that maybe isn't as physically uh, gifted or like is ranked lower, let's say. Um, but that's why... I always say hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard, right? And that, that counts for the mental part too. So, you know, I've played with guys that have had a bad attitude. I've been that guy myself. Not often, to be honest with you. I don't do it often because I know that it's, it's not a good thing. It's, 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 a, it's a huge um, – it's very toxic, you know? Yeah. And I feel bad. You know, I know when I've done it, the very few times I've done it, and usually this was much earlier in my career, uh, I feel bad about it, you know? And, and I realize that it's my fault. And you have to be honest with yourself, you know? Once, once I mean, because everyone's going to have a bad day physically. You know, you might not play your best tennis, but you can always give your best attitude uh, and give your best effort. Well, that's, that's really good. Um, can, you, um, can you give us 
some double secrets, whether it's drills or importance on volleys, uh, certain like uh, getting closer to the net, or I would say, especially if you think about like juniors, obviously pro players, they're so close to the net. It's so quick. Um, I, I mean, you can talk about that or what you would do in juniors a little bit more and, and mm. any, any, any secret advice. Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, uh, of course the doubles guys on tour were super, uh, explosive. So that enables us to get closer to the net, like you said. And, you know, if, if you guys can get closer to the net in doubles, I mean, it's going to make it easier for you to finish volleys and, and, and cover more of the net, get more net coverage. So you can, you know, be more effective up there and get to more balls. Um, so I definitely recommend that if possible. Of course, you got to remember, if you get close to the net, then you're, you guys become vulnerable to the lob, right? They can just go over you because you're so close. So have the awareness. If you do decide to come in and get close to the net, just use that. But then once your opponent starts lobbing, you have the awareness to, to drop back a little bit, right? So it's kind of a chess match like that, you know? Doubles, in many ways, it's chess, you know? I mean, you, there's only so many things you can do. Um, there's only so many plays you can run to, you know, you, you can serve to the T, you can serve to the body, you can serve wide, right? So there's three spots there and you just got to kind of mix up those spots. Uh, if you want to talk about the serve, um, I think a great play for you youngsters, a very basic doubles play serving is to serve like to the T or the body, like that area, and then have the neck guy, we say, pinch the middle, which means take the middle, right? So a great way to have success is serve to a certain spot. So the server hits the, the serve to a certain spot. And then that guy, we say, pinches that spot or, or fades to that spot or, or moves to that spot, really, um, of, of where you've hit the serve. And that's a basic strategy in doubles that's very effective. It's kind of like a home base play that a lot of guys start matches with or might start a game with that play or – or, or, or go to that play in an important moment because it's a, it's a very effective play and it's, it's a, it's a high percentage play really, and that's why. Um, and and it can take away your opponent's angles too because if you serve to the tee or the body, generally the opponent has to return through the middle of the court. Yeah. And if that's the case, and you have a neck guy right in the middle of the court, then what's going to happen? Boom! You finish the volley, chip chop. Thanks for coming. Have a nice day. <laughs> is it still true to to this day that whoever controls the middle usually controls the match so that's what i always you know what i try to think about is like whoever can control the middle whether it's the ball is going to cross court or that poaching position so i just wanted to get your thoughts on that oh yeah absolutely i mean that's that's doubles one-on-one i mean you know a lot of things are changing in, in tennis and you know physical equipment you know, diet, all that stuff. But the fundamentals will always generally be the same. You know, and we have to remember that. You know, and, you know, it's easy to get carried away with the new techniques this, uh, or new strategy, uh, new equipment, new technology, all that stuff. But, and, and you know, the, the, the strokes are modernizing. With, there's a lot, tons of spin. Everyone's using tons of spin. But a lot of strategy stuff is, is very uh, much the same and uh, will probably always be the same because, you know, the dimensions of the court – haven't changed and if that's the case then the strategy of tennis will generally be um be the same for for here from here on in 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 uh in uh i guess the professional world how hard is it to attack one person um how how much is there isolation whether the strategy is like are we going to play to the weaker play i say that because that's the number one strategy when you ask kids like are right, you about to play a tournament what's the goal like oh we're going to hit to this person because they're the weaker player that's yeah. pretty much the the primary strategy and then you have some that poach and maybe yeah. over poach and then you have some that just stay back and try to grind it out so yeah. I'm, I'm i'm trying to paint a picture to see what your thoughts are. On You're that. saying for a doubles tournament, for example, if you go to play a doubles tournament, what's the strategy? Yeah, the number one strategy is like, this person is a weaker player, I'm going to hit to them, but this person has a weaker player, this yeah. has weaker volley, so when they come to the net, that's yeah. like yeah. top two, three strategies that yeah. you're going to gonna get, so. Uh, th there's definitely something to be said for that. I mean, if you know that there's a glaring or drastic weakness, yeah. and of course, you have to attack that weakness, you know? Um, so, yeah, it's important to know your opponent. I think 
a lot a lot of pros nowadays don't really do that much homework on their opponents they don't do any research or they just kind of like will go with like what someone has told them um and you know maybe that person was telling you the truth maybe not i think it's important to do your homework on your opponents for sure um and, and no because let if, if, if you know the guy has a good forehand, you not you don't want to play with his forehand all day, right? If the guy has a weaker backhand and it's going to break down, then you want to attack that spot. Um, so th- I think that those are basic strategies that are, are definitely effective and useful. Um, and you can win matches that way. Um, but at the same time, it's also very important to continue to develop your own game. So if your only strategy is to play to this guy's weakness, well, Generally, guys, unless they just can't make the ball, they're going to have, like, their back ends weaker, but they're still going to make balls, right? And eventually, yeah. if, they're wait, if they're waiting for that shot because they know you're going to go there, then they can usually hit it for a winner. Um, so variety is important. I think it's also important to develop your own game and develop um, weapons that can work against anybody, regardless of who they are. Um, you know, for example, the slider wide. You should be able to hit that in ace, even if the guy has a better backhand return. Uh, on the on the on the ad side, for example, I'm a lefty, you're a lefty, so we hit that slider wide, the ad side. I mean, we should be able to pull him way off the court, open up the court, and then hit that next ball into the deuce, to the deuce yeah. corner, right? So there's certain one-two plays that you want to utilize uh, offensively, um, regardless of who your opponent is and whether or not they have weaknesses or not. So I, I think how about a good balance of those two strategies, <clears throat> I would say, is the ideal approach. And then how about formations? So, you know, uh, and that's yeah. actually the fun part of kids. Kids love doing formations. But, you know, like they like to do an eye formation, one up, one back, and trying to do different things. So from, yeah. from your standpoint, um, how if a, if a certain position is working, do you ever change? just to show something differently when, when, how are those conversations happening with your partner? Actually, that's a great question as well. Conversations with your partner. Beast, beast question, right there. Beast question. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, those are, I mean, th- that's really what, what the chemistry is all about. And like the balance of using uh, a play that's working and mixing something in um, just to throw guys off. I think, you know, if something's working, it, consistently you want to use it but not overuse it um because eventually you become predictable right so i i am working on that actually always um uh, because i i think a lot of players they have a tendency when things are going well they just keep using that play but guy other other players will adjust to you you know and if they notice patterns of you going to the same spot every time or using the same strategy every time they're going to be ready for it and then they're going to be able to respond effectively uh, so for that reason, even if it's working, you might mix it, it makes a new play, especially if you're up in the game. Let's say you're up 30 love or 40 love, even better. 40 love, 40, 15, you're ahead in the game. That's when you can try a new play that you haven't used before um, just to throw the guy off. And if it doesn't work, it's all good because you can go back to your, uh, your other play that was working and you're still ahead in the game, right? Mm-hmm. So, so those are like, we call those green light points. So if you're up 40 love, 40, 15, even 30 love, I mean, you know, if you're feeling confident, you're ahead and you're cruising, especially in a service game, um, you can you can use these green light points, which essentially means just go, try something new. You know, don't get stressed about it. Don't feel overwhelmed if you lose the point. doesn't matter. It's all good. You lost the point, who cares? If you won the point, great. So I now you get some confidence. You're up 40 love, you tried something new, it worked, oh, cool. Now you get confidence in a new skill set that you wouldn't really have used before, you know? And as you gain confidence in these new skill sets, you might start using them on important points, 30 all, or even break point down, uh, you know? And that's how you build your game. You know, you, it, tennis is about being confident with the skill sets that you have and, and having the confidence to use them in important moments. That's really what it's all about. And the more weapons that you have that work under pressure, that's what creates greatness, guys. I mean, that's million-dollar advice right there and, and talking about how to use it, when to use your strengths, when to develop new strengths or test them during mm-hmm. pressure points. So I think that's really great. Um, last one, few qu- one thing to add to that, you can also use it down love 40. 
Because think about it. If you're down low 40 in a game, especially receiving serve, like usually you should be holding your serve. If you're down low 40 and you're kind of out of the game anyway, you could try a new thing. Mix it yeah. up. You win that point. Suddenly it's 15-40. Try another one, 30-40. Now you're in the game. Yeah. So, but if you lose the point, who cares? You're down low 40 anyway. Yeah. Um, so – you got those are two good times to use that down low 40 up low, up low 40. Um, no, I really I really like that. No, no, that's really good. We'll make sure we uh we we keep talking about that. Um, I have few, just to give everyone notice, we only have a few more minutes left. Oh, uh, how long Jamie has? I know he's busy, but I have a few more questions and then we'll ask uh, you guys to. I know you already have some questions, but we'll add and go to your questions as well. My last two questions are number one, um, are there any singles drills that are really great for practicing doubles that you do? I mean, singles, I mean, a lot of these drills carry over between singles and doubles, quite frankly. I mean, you know, one singles drill that I think is, you know, extremely effective, um, is, uh, I mean, a serve plus one drill, we'll call it. So, like, you hit the serve, and then you hit a second ball, right? So, you know, I, I see a lot of top singles guys doing this drill, and it's um, it's a great drill uh, for anyone, singles or doubles, but I, I guess it's, it's definitely a more single-specific drill. So you'll hit a serve, or you can even shout out a serve, but I think it's, the best way to do it is hit the serve to a target. Yeah. And then the, the coach – somebody feeds you a ball, a second ball. So, and you can vary that feed, which is really the key to the drill. You can hit a laser beam uh, feed, which is like a world-class return deep. You have to hit like a half volley pickup shot. You see, uh, you see feds doing that, like kind of like a, like a quick, like a low, like you get low at the legs, low at the core um, and just kind of redirect um, a lot of singles guys. I mean, that's how they thrive. I mean, you, you see it on TV and you're like, Oh wow. How did he hit that shot? Well, these guys actually practice that shot, you know? So yeah. it seems spectacular to you guys and to me, quite frankly, because it's still an amazing shot. Um, and when you see them do it, it's like, how do you do that? Well, they work on that. They actually work on that specific detail. Um, so that's one one thing. Or you can just feed like a like an average kind of short ball, kind of floater that you come up and just destroy it into the corner for, uh, for a winner. You know, that's another important, I mean, shot to work on. And then there's the mid range where you kind of like kind of have to like run to the side, scramble to the side, uh, explode, use that explosive first step uh, to getting to the ball. That's a good drill. Uh, that's an actually an amazing drill, very important drill. And then um, I would say one more drill that's good for a single drill that would help your doubles, um, especially if you're playing one up one back, is a drill where you just hit cross court groundies, right? So you feed the ball. Um, and then rally cross court and then any short ball that you get you rip it and come in so it's like a transition so you're rallying cross and then any like average ball a little bit shorter that you can attack you just explode forward pounce on that ball uh, attack it and move forward and then look to dig out a volley or hit a, or finish a high volley um, whatever ball comes to you but that's that's a really effective drill too nice and when you're when you're training like doubles so Obviously, the tricky part about training doubles is not only do you need to have a partner there, but you need a, another two people to have a, a, a practice match or practice drill. So a lot of you know, a lot of times, like, what does your training look like? With, do you always train with the same partner, uh, tr switching partners? What, what is the what does tennis specific doubles training look like? Great question. Um, you know. You're, you're right in one way, but I, you're also, let's say, not completely correct because it's ideal and, and great to have your partner to practice with, and you do need to do some practice sets and you know, communicate and all that stuff and play matches. Um, and that's great for team chemistry. So I think a combination of, of team practice, but then also individual practice. Um, so even though doubles is a team game, you still got to develop your individual skill sets, right? Mm -hmm. So a, a nice, healthy balance of those two is the ideal way to develop a doubles team because um, you, want, you want the sum of both parts to also to be growing uh, as the individuals work on their individual skill sets to make the team better when they come back together. Um, 
and, and obviously communicate to each other what you're working on when you are doing your individual work. Of course, you want to have awareness and usually you can identify weaknesses that need to be worked on based on your practices. You know, maybe you have a practice match and this didn't go well, that didn't go well and you're missing the serve spot. Okay, we need to improve that. We need to work on the spot location of the serve. Maybe I need to work on finishing that volley. So a couple, uh, you know, volley, volley, reflex volley drills. Um, I have got a ton of those that I can share with you because um, yeah. that's kind of like my specialty. Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. you can maybe you can send us a, like either like a sheet or videos or anything. I'm sure everybody would be really excited for that. So that would be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I can happy to get a little video going of some, some practices and I can shoot it your way. No worries. That would be great. Uh, that's good. Um, I have one more question, but before I get to mine, I guess I'll open up. What's that? I see you, David, with the thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to see what, let's see what questions we have so far. And this is the time. Feel free to ask uh, any questions. Uh, have you, I guess you ever played in Grand Slams? How far? I, we mentioned that you were two time quarterfinals at Wimbledon. Is that your favorite tournament, favorite memory, or do you have something else? With Those great are memories, yeah. No, great question. Thanks for asking, guys, and thanks for bringing that stuff up. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, those are some of the most special times in my life, uh, along with, you know, of course, my my college experience at Brown. But Wimbledon, just the, the just be, playing there in general was an amazing thing, and to to go to the quarterfinals uh, a couple times was just, yeah. I'll always remember those and be grateful for those days. And you know, I was able to share them with my family and my friends, which was even more special. Um, I think, uh, actually, you know, it was a cool memory was, um, I actually, so during this whole quarantine, I've been home spending a lot of time with my family and my mom actually mentioned that I played a match against Roger Federer, uh, earlier in my career and she had the DVD. So I hadn't watched the match since the match had been played because I just been so busy. It's been 12, 12 years now, I guess it was in 2009. And so we, we had a, a screening of, of the match so I watched it on my laptop and that was a cool one so I definitely um it was cool to watch it again too I'm pretty pretty okay. grateful for that for that opportunity wow that's uh uh do you, are you happy with the way you played when you're looking back at it are you happy oh my with God. The way? it was wild man I mean I haven't seen it since since then and and I didn't look a little, whole lot different to be honest with you like you said um but you know, I was still bald back then, actually. Um, so, which is kind of crazy, but you know, it went early. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I connected with a great partner, uh, Assam Qureshi, who I'm sure you guys have heard of. He's from Pakistan. He's a great guy, and he's doing a lot for charity right now, giving back to his his um, his people, the people of his country, which is great. Uh, he played awesome. I played awesome, and it was just one of those matches where I just kind of rose to the occasion and I was very nervous before that match guys so if you guys any of you guys get nervous before your matches I get it you know it's, it's totally normal I was scared I, I actually called my mom I asked her for a little bit of extra support you know <laughs> mental and spiritual support because she was back in the states I, the match we played the match was in Europe it was in Switzerland actually on Rogers home court and somehow we got the win I mean we played really well it was yeah, I got I got goosebumps watching that match. So it was pretty cool. That's a that's a great story. That's a really great story. Um, is uh, yeah. Um, is uh, well, I actually have a bunch of Roger questions, but it's not about me. I'm going to read the kids' questions. What well, we had Ishan and Abiraj ask similar question. What's your favorite surface? What what kind of what type of court do you like to play on the most, and why? Um. You know, that's a good question. It's kind of var it's varied over the course of my career. I used to be like love to play on grass. Of course, I did great at Wimbledon those couple of years, um, and, I, and then I loved to play on hard. And then it was clay. I've kind of, you know, that that the answer to your question has has changed over time. That is the best way I could answer that question. It's 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 evolved over time. It's just changed with with the way I've changed and the way I've grown. You know, in my game. Uh, you know, I went to Europe. I played seven, eight years of club matches, trying to make money to get by over there. And it was a great experience for me because I learned how to play on clay and uh, I really enjoy playing on clay now. So um, for me, the answer would be like, as long as I have like two or three weeks to prepare, 
the right way and really get my reps in and, and feel confident and, and have my good consistency going, then I like, I like all the surfaces. Nice. Um, Medina wants to know who is your, who is by your side the most supporting your mom or dad? <laughs> <laughs> putting you on the spot for it. hopefully hopefully they're not watching right now <laughs> um you know it was 50 50 for me i gotta be honest with you they were both amazing always so i'm, I'm super blessed and, and grateful to have both of them all the way through my career and, and even today i mean I, I talked to my mom this morning and my dad and uh we had a nice chat and, and they're just They've been a great solid rock foundation for me my whole life. So uh, they're different. They're totally different people. <laughs> my dad was like the hardcore, you know, like motivator. Um, and was like super getting me pumped up all the time. And then my mom was more uh, into school and like the importance of like getting uh, my academics taken care of. And um, so she was really pushing me in, in to, be, to be doing my homework every day taking care of business in the classroom. Um, well, they did their job getting into Brown and playing at Brown. So they did their job. So I guess each you, you they did do the 50, 50 part. So <laughs> thanks man. Um, let's see what else we got. Um, who's your favorite doubles player that you played with? Um, That's a tough question. To ask. There are a lot of great ones, but you know, Leander Pace is Leander Pace. I mean, I playing with him was just a remarkable experience. I learned so much from Lee. Lee, if you're out there, I know you are somewhere, but uh, I appreciate you and, and all, all the things you taught me on the tour uh, and on the court. I mean, he's just a seasoned veteran, legend of the game. Um, so he's up there. And then, you know, you know who I really enjoyed playing with was, um, you know, and we had a lot of success, Leander and I, so that's always nice when you have a great success like that. Uh, he helped me a lot with some wild cards too. So that was, you know, a huge thing that he did for me. And then Mike Bryan, you know, he and I played uh, once a couple of years ago. And that was awesome because he's a great dude. And we're actually very similar. It's funny, like, you, you compete against these guys all the time. And they're kind of your enemies because you don't really know them that well. They're not your enemies, but they're your competition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you kind of look up to these guys. And the Bryans are, have been incredible for the game of doubles and for the, for the game of tennis, quite frankly, in this country and, and, and globally. Uh, everywhere in the world so uh you know playing with him was cool because i realized that we are very similar in our personality and uh the way we approach the game uh so actually we've we become very good buds so i texted him the other day we stay in touch um about a lot of stuff he's he's a guy that does a lot of details you know he he's into the longevity and diet and and all these various life hacks and ways you can get better um and really extend the, the the shelf life of your career a lot of these guys you, you notice you guys are all young 11 12 13 14 15 16 that's great um I'm jealous but you know a lot of players are playing to their late 30s 40s now and that's becoming a more common trend rogers rogers 38 he's my age so oh. for all you guys out there that want to have a long career it's a sport of a lifetime nice uh, that's really good. And, uh, you know, the, one of the stories I always like to tell people when young young kids don't, it's hard to hear it. It was hard for me, but it's like you you only have one vehicle. It's like your car is your body and you you're, you got this and you can never trade it in. You can't sell it. You can't buy a new one. You only have one. So you better take care of it. So I think that that's really good. Um, last few questions. If you could play doubles with anyone, who would it be? Right now? Um... Or he can either be of all time. I don't mind. I'll, I'll... <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there you go. I mean, no, no that's a good question. I, got, I thought about that. I mean, who would I like to play with? I mean, it would be it would be cool to play with like uh, maybe Sampras. Yeah. Maybe maybe Johnny Mac would be cool too. <laughs> I, I I think Sampras's serve. Yeah, Sampras's serve is pretty awesome. And he's a great volley. I mean, he just, he did so many things well. Yeah. I think it would be, that would be a fun experience. Nice. People keep asking about the Grand Slams. I said it in info. He has played all the Grand Slams and two times quarterfinalists at Wimbledon. So definitely, yeah, yeah definitely cool. Um, I will ask then, put you on the spot. What are you working on your game currently? My forehand. 
so I'm, I'm down here playing these singles matches and I've been playing great, actually serving great. Um, coming to the net, like my, my volleys are always kind of like my strength. So I'm, I'm very sharp there and very happy with that, with that cleanliness. Mm. Uh, backhand is, is also a strength of mine and I really enjoy hitting it. It's a lefty thing. Yeah. People don't know when they play lefties, they always go to the backhand, but I'm like, guys, <laughs> lefties love their backhands. I hit it, it just boom, boom, <laughs> Um, so I'm working on the forehand, keeping the elbow high a little bit, you know, because sometimes I bring, I bring my elbow in. I don't know if you guys are watching, but uh, I just kind of like get jammed here, you know. I want to try to get the elbow out so I can get good spacing, you know, and then follow through to the target and just working on like getting a longer hitting zone there. Um, so, yeah, that's what we've been working on and, and just going for it, you know, just having that belief in the, the – confidence of going for your shots is super important so really that's really awesome can you actually tell a little bit about people what you're doing in here in Brainton Sarasota Florida right now can you tell them a little bit what you're doing because a lot of people are quarantined not being able to do anything but you're actually playing under uh uh and getting broadcasts so can you tell people a little bit about that where they can find you watch you play yeah guys thanks uh, well first of all I'm glad everyone's safe and happy and sorry healthy um you know, don't do not do anything crazy. I know you guys are all doing the right things and following the uh, guidelines of the of the local, uh, you know, government. I guess they're up in Philadelphia, right? So, yep. um, you know, I'm very fortunate. My buddy, he set up a, a small little uh, exhibition tour. So it gives us, us players an opportunity to get off the, um, get off the couch a little bit and, and come down here and get some matches in and, they've relaxed things a little bit now with the quarantine down here. And, and so we're lucky to be able to um, get on the court and, and we're still being safe and practicing social distancing. There's only about 15 people on the site. So there's no fans and we're just playing matches basically and singles matches. So we're not, at, we're not giving high fives. There's no handshakes at the end of the match. We just touch rackets. <laughs> so um, we're, we're, we're being creative and, and just, Harry Chikma, who, who you know, Sanjin, has done a great job of organizing this. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm actually down here to do that, to, to stay fit, get some exercise, and keep keep the game sharp. Um, and also, I'm raising a little bit of money for a charity, a, a similar program that you guys have up in, up in the Boston area called Tenacity. I'm sure you've heard of it. Yep. So I'm, I'm starting a fundraiser this weekend to um, help generate some funds for that program. Um, so, you know, it, it's a way for me to kind of do uh, a little bit of good for the community as well. So I'm pretty... They can watch on ESPN, right? It's on yeah, ESPN. you can watch on ESPN3. If you have the app, just download the app on your, on your phone, uh, ESPN3. And uh, I think you got to get like a username and password there. I'm not sure. I think you have to sign up for an account to uh, see how, it, how that works. Um, and and how yeah. else can they, can they follow you on Instagram? What's the best way to, to keep in touch with you? Yeah, my Instagram is just my name. You see my name there, James Saratani. I don't think the A is in there. So it's just James Saratani. Um, you guys give me a follow and just follow along online. And I'll stay in touch with you guys if you have any questions about, you know, what it means, what it takes to get better, improve along your pathway to, to your individual successes and team successes. I'm, I'm happy to help. Nice. Well, thank, thank you so much for your time. Is there any last piece of advice that you want to add anything to this group? Well, I just think you guys have to, you know, continue to have fun out there. You know, I know, I know there's going to be a lot of challenges. This is a crazy time for everybody. Um, but, you know, always look at the, the good in the situation and, and, and try to focus on the positives uh, of the day. I know sometimes there's more negatives than positives or setbacks, but if you keep a good mindset and a good attitude and, you know, keep your, hold your head high, good things eventually will happen. I promise you that. Always think positive. All right. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for your time. We had a whole hour. I really appreciate it. I know how busy you are. And thank you for taking time with myself and uh, all the kids here to get this experience and everyone who will watch it after. Uh, it was really, really great. I, I got a lot of it, and I, I'm sure everyone else as well did. And those who watched, thank you as well for, for tuning in. So. Thanks, Anjan. Appreciate the time. Thanks for the hour, guys. And uh, I wish you guys only the best moving forward. And 
I have an open open door. So just hit me up on Insta and stay in touch. All right. There you guys go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. See you, buddy. See you guys.